Aloha, this is Paul Brubaker, principal of TZ Economics in Kailua, Hawaii. And this is a follow-up webcast for participants in a couple of meetings, one I missed, one I attended, uh, a follow-up for the PADA TTRA a gang, and a bonus for the CCIM group who, with whom I've met in the past and wasn't able to today. I'm going to launch right into the slides I prepared. Uh, bonus material, as I say, for the PADA TTRA gang, and uh, maybe some new insights for the CCIM crowd on uh, commercial real estate towards the end. So there's some additional takeaways from the ones we talked about in the PADA TTRA conference. And uh, the first is just a note on some of the macro issues that uh, Aaron raised, the uh, speaker from Tourism Economics uh, from the mainland, who gave us some really great global and national macroeconomic and tourism insights. Um, I wanted to add a little Hawaii flavor to the part that Joe Roos from Hawaii DBED uh, did not comment directly on. So here are the inflation statistics for the US and Hawaii. And take note, Hawaii has been running below the US average, the US urban average, uh, throughout the inflation event that unfolded after March 2021 and uh, peaked in the spring and summer of 2022 and is now a turn negative, as we'll see in a second, on, a, uh, on an annualized basis if you look at the, at the incremental, at the marginal monthly or bi-monthly reports in the case of Honolulu. We've got negative numbers adding to the positive numbers over the course of the last year, then dragging the average, the 12-month uh, increase, let's say the year-over-year -year increase, uh, back towards the Fed's target of the goal of 2% measured by the personal consumption expenditure deflated, deflator. These are the consumer price index uh, measures, which tend to be a little bit higher, maybe a quarter to a half percentage point higher. So you can see um, inflation uh, broke out after the last of the three federal fiscal stimuli, the, the CARES Act in March of 2020, the um, Consolidated Appropriations Act in, in December of 2020. So about two trillion in the first round, another eight or 900 billion uh, in the second round at the conclusion of the Trump administration. And then early on in the Biden administration in March of 2021, uh, the ARPA stimulus, all of which had mixes of support for corporations and businesses, and uh, towards the end, more towards households and individuals and state and local governments. And you can see the inflation emerging as vaccination rolled out and the reopening in the economy combined with the buildup in household savings and, and uh, purchasing power from uh, huge infusion, $3 trillion in transfers of one sort or another to individuals, to companies, and to state and local governments. The inflation rate might have peaked um, uh, even, even within a year of that stimulus had it not been for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which added additional pre pressures to global energy markets and things like grain markets where Ukraine is a major contributor. And so you see that a little extension of inflation, a bit of an inflation scare actually in mid-2022, but the bottom line is Hawaii inflation peaked in March of 2022. It liftoff occurred in March 2021. It peaked 12 months later, and now the inflation rate at the end of 2022 in, in Hawaii was lower than inflation rate in Hawaii in January of 22. So the year, the inflation rate ended lower than it actually started, and the momentum, as I mentioned earlier, the incremental uh, uh, consumer price index uh, changes actually turned negative in the fourth quarter. Uh, so if you annualize the negative contribution, it, it, it brings the overall, you can see that curve there, it, it brings the overall trajectory down and we should see disinflation continuing uh, as Aaron suggested in some of the forecast uh, materials uh, from tourism economics. And as uh, Joe indicated in the DBED forecast, from a component standpoint, same story all year long, all 22, uh, 2022, uh, long, the fuels uh, complex um, uh, leading uh, throughout the year. These are the November uh, components of urban Hawaii inflation. And then food, as I say, grains, partly because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
but more generally, the uh, and of course, there's an avian flu that's been uh, affecting uh, the egg laying industry across the America more than actually, uh, you know, the the rest of the poultry industry industry. But those are special cases. More more broadly, you have supply chain disruptions that uh, were on that that constrained the ability of production worldwide to supply uh, the the uh, ex, the increase in demand, excess demand, creating these inflationary pressures. And oddly, uh, vehicles for most of the year, uh, including used vehicles, so spillover of excess demand from new to used vehicles, that began to reverse, as you see here. In, at the end of 22. And uh, the good news for everybody is that alcoholic beverages are actually pulling the inflation rate down at year end. When you look at the actual consumer price index, the, 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 not the inflation rate, which is a measure of change in the price level, but the, but the actual CPI, uh, you can see right away the lifts off after March 2021, after that series of fiscal stimuli, combined, of course, with very accommodative monetary policy at the time. That's, of course, been normalized in the last year. And at this, uh, actually, at, as we speak here, uh, Jay Powell will be holding a press conference tomorrow morning to announce um, what's likely to be a deceleration in the rate of increase of the overnight uh, lending rate that we'll look at in just a second, because they are approaching the point where they've, having slammed on the brakes last year, uh, may have achieved all they need to, as we see these Inflation rates come down, and, and in, in the case here of the CPI, the actual index starting to reverse at the end of 2022. Now, the breakdown of what's called the headline rate, which on an annualized basis is maybe 6% for Hawaii over the last two years or you know uh, seven quarters, um, into the portion that's sort of supply shock related and the portion that's coming from the demand side of the economy, and then the part the 2% objective that the Fed had even prior to the pandemic and has had for a decade now an explicit 2% inflation goal, you can see in that diagonal line there, which for Hawaii had a slope of 1.6%, so something in the neighborhood of two, but uh, not quite two, an issue that you know was persistent throughout the late 20-teens and indeed most of the decade. And I've, I've re-indexed so that March 2021 is 100. So you can, you can kind of see the breakdown of the two percentage points that's in the target and then two percentage points that's coming from the so-called core rate. That's sort of, that's the part of inflation that excludes food and energy costs. So it takes out two unusually volatile components and leaves you sort of with the, you know, the core, the core of the inflation. And then, and then the headline rate, which for which the difference, again, two percentage points, two plus two, two is the 6% that I talked about as the annualized inflation rate as it now comes down and returns to the, returns to the pre-COVID trend and uh, you know, the objective that the Fed had. Um, th those components uh, nicely sort of illustrate the distribution between supply and demand shocks, about 50-50 at this point. Uh, another important re reminder that the recent experience, which happened in about 12 months in Hawaii and is going to now unwind in about 12 to 18 months, uh, is a, a, a very much a, a short term to medium term inflation shock, not a long drawn out uh, experience with uh, the crescendo that we saw in the 60s and 70s and rise with rising inflation expectations, or even in the Japan bubble era of the 1980s or the subprime bubble era of the early 2000s, where housing uh, became a, a momentum builder in both of those um, uh, bubbles and, and where energy prices, energy shocks in the 70s punctuated what was an underlying uh, move uh, upward for inflation in an environment in which monetary policy was not perceived as credible at the time in terms of its in anti-inflation commitment. And so the recent experience is much more like what we saw back in the 40s and the 50s uh, in, the, in the late territorial era for Hawaii with world war, demobilization from the war, the dock worker strike uh, at the end of the 1940s, and then uh, two shocks in the, the Korean war. And I'm not sure what happened in the 50s there, but you can see that profile where it happened very quickly. It was gone after two or three years. I'm pretty sure that's what we're going through 
in this particular environment. But because of the, the, the heartbreaking that the Fed introduced in monetary policy last year with 75 basis point rate increases, target overnight rate increases at its uh, regularly scheduled monetary policy making meetings, the mortgage rates jumped from 3% at this time last year to uh, just over 7% in November or at the end of October and, um, and really overshot. I mean, sort of expressing the, the near panic that existed in bond market participants and, and, and uh, among other economic agents uh, during the course of the year as inflation looked as if it might become unhinged, uh, burned off very quickly as we saw those numbers, the actual inflation numbers subside. And, and for those of us who were thinking, well, it, it, this is not the 1970s, uh, it, it looks now like the overshoot from five to six to seven percent uh, mortgage rates, which is probably unwarranted, is burning off really quickly. A mortgage rate right around six percent last week, and I think we'll see a five handle uh, a- as soon as the coming month. And uh, and equilibrium is probably in the neighborhood of four to five percent when all is said and done. Maybe not the four percent we saw throughout the twenty teens expansion, uh, but. Um, you know, we've got a shot at it. My guess is something closer to four and a half to five percent is where we end up at the end of uh, at the end of this year, maybe entering 2024. Now, that 400 basis point increase in mortgage rates is something nobody who's been a real estate market participant for the last 40 years has ever seen. Right. You have to go back to 1981. So it's been 40 years since you saw an interest rate increase, a mortgage interest rate increase that was as abrupt as the one we experienced last year, or that was as large, a 400 basis point change, uh, because disinflation and the building of a credible reputation by the monetary authority for an anti-inflationary posture has led the mortgage rate to fall almost continuously, very steadily at any rate for four decades. So this is what's happened in the last year is really extraordinary from a couple of standpoints, not so much from the inflation standpoint itself, which as you can see here in the background, um, for Hawaii did not was not the highest in the last 40 years, is barely higher than it was 15 years ago and not as high as it was 30 years ago. And, and as I say, the disinflationary uh, perception of both economic agents and financial market participants and the monetary authority uh, over the last generation uh, resulted in this gradual subsidence that was only temporary disrupted as it turned out. Now, it, it was a hammer blow for the housing market, no doubt. But what I'm suggesting is that it should unwind pretty quickly in the course of calendar 2023. Uh, one reassuring aspect of that is that inflation expectations remain well anchored, to use the language of the Fed. That is the uh, difference between nominal interest rates and the real interest rates that are represented by the, by the Treasury's inflation protected security. So you take nominal Treasury bond yields and you subtract the tip yield at the same maturity from five to 30 years. And provide, it provides you with an actual term structure of inflation expectations, uh, except for becoming unhinged somewhat uh, a year ago and, and, with political ramifications, right in the last in the midterm elections, Republicans seem to glom onto this for some reason. Uh, when, I mean, to my mind, it wasn't really an issue. But you know, there you go, that happened, and the five-year inflation expectation soared above three, three and a half percent momentarily a year ago before subsiding more recently, and the inversion in that term structure. So the expectation at the thirty-year maturity was always two and a quarter percent plus or minus. But the five-year went above it and has now come back to a range of, you know, two and a quarter, 2.3, 2.2, 2.3%. About 20 or 30 basis points of which is probably an inflation risk premium anyway, or maybe a liquidity premium combined with an inflation uh, risk premium. And I need to change the headline on this. This is from my last, the last time I've, I've done it. It's more like 2. 2. 2.26 to 2.3, not 2.5%. At any rate, you know, we're back in the zone and I think there's no uh, real issue here. The Fed will continue to um, tighten 
its target rate just slightly, maybe 25, 50 basis points uh, we might see in the first half of 2023. And they'll continue to allow the balance sheet uh, to subside in magnitude uh, in, in terms of its holdings of treasury securities, mortgage-backed securities. The, the announced case has been about $95 billion per month. Uh, so as those securities mature, they, uh, they run off the balance sheet. Uh, they roll off the balance sheet without replacement. So the, the Fed is no longer buying those securities. And as pre-announced, that means a steady diminution on the asset side of the balance sheet, which is the counterpart to draining the, the liquidity that built up uh, first after the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008, but more recently with the onset of the pandemic in March of 2020, um, confidence is liquidity. And when there's a concern about a, a loss of confidence in the, in the banking system uh, or the financial system generally, uh, it's a tendency to, for uh, you know, flight to liquidity. Uh, in, over the last decade, that's taken the form of reserve deposits at the Fed of the, commercial, the member banks, commercial banks reserve deposits. But you can see more recently in the composition of the liabilities of the Federal Reserve, the Fed's been moving towards using reverse repos, which are kind of short-term loan, kind of think of it as an overline, overnight loan to the banks. Uh, so they acquire liquidity overnight from the Fed itself uh, in these reverse repos as a substitute for holding cash in their reserves, reserve account. So that'll continue. And as I've mentioned already, the Fed's own expectation of the trajectory for the overnight rate is that it might hit five to five and a quarter percent in the course of the remainder of 2023 uh, before subsiding over the next couple of years, maybe faster, you know, if the inflation come down, comes down really fast and the Fed gets lucky and a soft landing is the outcome as opposed to the, the, the recession that some people are expecting. It's kind of a 50-50 bet at this point and the, the odds of a mild recession are probably higher than the odds of a, of a, you know, a hard landing. But um, I mean, the Fed tells us all of this. You can see how rapidly rates went up and it, it's possible that rates could come down uh, just as rapidly if we return to a Goldilocks scenario sooner than expected. Take note of the long-term equilibrium risk-free overnight rate there, 2.5%. Think about the term structure you'd expect in a normal world. Um, that is one in which normalization, as they were calling it, uh, before the pandemic uh, had occurred. And you might see a, a long bond yield, a 10-year note yield around 3%, which would be consistent with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage rate in the neighborhood of 4.75. I mean, if you sort of sort of lining up uh, the constellations uh, when, uh, when things get back to normal. Now, a, a high interest rate environment in the United States and dollar-denominated assets with a relatively low interest rate environment, although catching up a little uh, in Japan with the Bank of Japan, uh, I, I think they recently, uh, I, I think they had a cap on the 10 year uh, uh, JGB, Japanese government bond yield that has been allowed to be violated. Um, so they've been easing up or actually allowing a tightening, a self tightening to unfold in Japan as well. But the interest rate spread pulled up the value of US dollar and depreciated the Japanese yen all the way to 140 yen per dollar at one point last November. So I hope you bought some or went to Japan on vacation. Uh, but even at 130 yen, which is roughly where it's been uh, as we entered 2023, uh, at the very low end of the yen's value over the history of the last you know, 20, 30 years pre-COVID for which we have good data, a, a weak yen means lower spending in dollars by Japanese visitors, and it means less Japanese investment in, uh, in residential and commercial real estate. So we're at the extreme end of the spectrum of those exchange rate movements for the last 30 years. And uh, what do I have here? January 2001 through March 2020. So that's a, that's a pretty long high frequency data set for 20 years. And you know, the, the, the yen arrived at about 100 20 yen per dollar back in 1988. So that's, you know, the, the zone has been, the yen has been stronger than that for much of the last 20 or 30 years. We're definitely at the low end of the range. The range is maybe 
eighty-five to one hundred twenty-five uh, yen per dollar, and we're in the in the high one twenties. Um, final inflation factor, just to keep in mind. Um, and by the way, a strong dollar actually mitigates some of the inflation pressure by making imports less expensive. That be interesting as China ramps up again to see where that goes. And and um, but an, another factor I think it's important to recognize is that uh, corporate profits uh, have increased a lot over the post, you know, since the pandemic arrived um, from about 12% of uh, uh, value added in, in the US to more than 16%. So, you know, at least a one third increase, maybe as much as a 40 or 50% increase in non-financial corporate profits is a proportion of uh, uh, US value added. That's a, okay. So something's going on there that has, there's a market power there story that, you know, not everything at the supermarket needed to get as expensive as it did. It was, there's ha there has been an exercise uh, in market power underway. Uh, that's non-trivial. And I think you'll see, you know, the Federal Trade Commission and other agencies looking at that. Okay, the other big takeaway from the uh, from the pandemic is uh, changes in the workforce. And uh, that manifests in a couple of ways. Uh, one thing everybody's dealing with and some of the other panelists at the PADA TTRA um, conference were talking about this um, uh, Ryan Tanaka, who's head of the Restaurant Association, and, and his colleagues on that panel discussion were talking about the challenges in, in hiring and, and you know retaining uh, employees. And it, it, there are many dimensions of this, part of which is a legacy of the pandemic itself, right? People in customer-facing positions have more biological risk exposure, for example. So many people just made choices uh, not to return to that kind of employment. There's been burnout in other industries and certainly in the healthcare sector where, where health professionals went through a lot and some of them just said, that's it, I'm out. Um, more generally, people who left the workforce early, uh, people approaching retirement in the boomer cohort, um, maybe left early and chose not to return. Um, and then just a pattern of mismatch because of other structural changes that will look briefly add or to which we will allude at the very least. Um, so, you know, things like problem uh, trying to get daycare, which disproportionately affects um, working mothers and um, yeah, just a bunch of stuff going on. So when you look at the data right now for job openings, as opposed to where measures of labor market slack are, um, they're just off the charts. Right, so there are way more open jobs than there have been historically relative to the number of persons out of work and looking to work. Twice as many job openings for a given unemployment rate, or that's to say, you know, two jobs open for every person unemployed, essentially. So, you know, way off the chart, uh, way more job openings than we've seen relative uh, to the pool of labor that's available in terms of unemployed persons, a part of which is structural, right? There are pe people who are between jobs, and in fact, one of the things we saw over the last couple of years was briefly called the great resignation where, where people found that, you know, the, on the supply side of the labor market, right, people had more power than historically has been the case. So that labor shortage has been an issue. And just a comment about layoffs, a lot of people, we see this in the, in the media where uh, every, every corporation, every corporate layoff, press release is being trumpeted is something that tells us we're headed down over the cliff into recession. Well, it's true that there have been layoffs. It's also true that they tend to be firm or sector specific, right? They're happening in specific companies and specific industries for specific reason, reasons. And I'm not saying they're not important to keep track of because um, large scale layoffs are problematic. But, but here's the thing, before the pandemic, we had 1.8 million layoffs in America every month anyway. I mean, that's just the normal churn is 1.8 million. And post arrival of, you know, post COVID arrival, it's downshifted to 1.4 million. So yet another measure of labor market tightness is that notwithstanding the headlines and maybe, maybe ignore the headlines because so far the unemployment uh, churn uh, has remained at 1.4 million. And that's a theme that's going to come up again and again now, as we look at more deeply at this, uh, a word in economics sometimes used hysteresis, which is uh, 
things you think are changes you think are temporary, which turn out to be permanent, right? You tell me, is 1.8 million the right number? Because it was the right number. It was the amount of monthly churn on a seasonally adjusted basis for the longest expansion in history, you know, certainly in US history, uh, 10, 10 years of economic expansion, wherein every month 1.8 million workers were laid off in America because people leave jobs and then they go to other jobs. Now it's 1.4 million and it's not changing. That's something's changed. The norm, what's normal is different from what it was pre COVID. And so let's look at that a couple of different ways. This is, these are Google searches on the phrase working from home, right? You can actually go to Google search or something. I can't remember. It's in the footnote, by the way, if you want to get a copy, uh, Google trends, if you want to get a copy of these slides, uh, shoot me an email or figure out how to reach me. But every slide has the links to the data at the bottom and the, and the source line of the slide. And so you can check it out or update or whatever you want to do. But if you, if you scale Google searches on the phrase working from home to the highest point after the onset of COVID in the spring of 2020, scale that to 100, then you can see pre-COVID, the index was at about seven or eight. So there's seven or 8% as many searches on the phrase working from home pre-COVID as there were in the spring of 2020 when we were all working from home, seems like, or a bunch of people were working from home. And it's settled, but it's settled at a higher number than existed pre-COVID. It's settled at a level that's at least twice as high. And a year ago, it was three times as high uh, after some methodological changes in the way they define it over Google. Um, so. The new normal is one in which twice as many searches on the phrase working from home are occurring on a regular basis than was true before the pandemic. And indeed, pre-pandemic, 90% of workers or 89 point something percent, 89 exactly percent, either never or almost never worked from home. And less than 5% of US workers ever worked from home full time. Um, so that's... That's different because now we can see in household pulse surveys from the Census Bureau, which by the way, kudos to those guys, props to those guys, they invented these surveys on the fly. It usually takes years or decades for the census to field new surveys and they whip these things out within about six months of the pandemic. They've asked the question different ways, but in the fall of 2022, they were asking the, you know, the survey participants, uh, you know, how many, uh, or do, you know, do you live in a household where someone teleworked or worked from home in the last seven days? That's the question. And the answer is at least 20%, 20 to 25% of respondents in Hawaii, so these Hawaii residents, right? 20 to 25%, at least a fifth, up to a quarter, lived in households in which somebody worked from home in the last week. So it used to be 10%, now it's at least 20%. That's a big change. Hawaii's about average for the US in terms of the numbers of establishments that increase telework, and we'll see how durable it is, but these are interesting surveys. The larger companies uh, were, uh, you know, uh, were more enthusiastic adopters, um, but the, the, the adoption in Hawaii uh, in terms of establishments is about the same as the small business pattern, about 30 to 35% more uh, uh, of establishments increased telework. And then if you look at establishments that have full-time work from home, Hawaii's at the lower end of the spectrum, about 7%. And just an example, by industry, you see this more prevalent in information industries and professional and technical and business services, finance, and so on. In fact, we can look at the industry composition from 2022, which is starting to be a more normalized period uh, and um, as opposed to a, a you know a COVID infused uh, period, and there at the top of the list, finance, insurance, professional, technical services, information industries, etc., and at the bottom of the list, industries where you've got to be on the job site, accommodation, food services, construction, you know, makes sense in terms of occupational uh, prevalence. Uh, people with math and STEM skills, right? Uh, science, computer, and math skill occupations, legal occupations business and financial operations, et cetera, et cetera, sciences, architecture, engineering, management. You see higher adoption of telework. And again, in terms of occupational uh, adoption, farming, food preparation, building maintenance, construction, transportation, they're all at the low end 
where, you know, you've got to be on the job site, you've got to be operating the piece of equipment. In an informal survey I ran last week in a small webinar we were doing, we had about 40 or 45 people interested in economics, or there were more than that on the call, but about 40 or 45 that actually responded. Uh, see if you can remember these numbers. Pre-COVID, the mean number of days people worked in the conventional workplace was four. And as of 2023, the mean number was about three and one third. So let's say 1.6 or 1.7% um, is the uh, average number of days people work from home among this cohort, which is not randomly sampled. And it's kind of the nerd, right? It's the Hawaii Economic Association uh, social club. But uh, from one day or slightly less than one, right, 0.95, to 1.6 or 1.7. Those are interesting numbers. We'll come back to in just a second. And you can see the by um, bifurcation there or the, 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 the right there. Um, anyway, there are two, there are two nodes. What's this multinodal? What's the expression? Mo, mo, multimodal, right? So there's a, right? Me, median mode. So the, there's, a, there's a mode out there at five days a week where 70% used to respond and now it's 40 something percent. And then there's a mode way down at, at one day a week where um, the numbers have actually gone up. But again, the mean used to be at one, about one day a week, not quite. And now it's about 1.6, 1.7 days a week that uh, the average person in the sample goes to the office. In the American Community Survey, uh, where the definitions are slightly different, but Teleworking or working from home doubled from about five, five and a half percent to about 10 or 11 percent. And my guess is it's a step function. You can see related to that commute times, which had risen over the last or the, over the pre-COVID decade from about 25 minutes to about 28 minutes. These are average commute times here in Hawaii. So an increase of about 10 percent, let's say uh, that those went down, went back to where they were a decade ago. You know, my guess is that the increase in the share uh, teleworking is is L-shaped and that the and that the commute times will start growing again over the remaining portion of the 2020s. That's just queuing theory. But uh, we're seeing again this L-shaped kind of increase in adoption of remote work and a decreased utilization of conventional workplaces, which has really important implications both for commercial real estate and a number of classes, as well as for for the housing market. So let's let's see if we can layer on some additional um, flavoring to help understand this. Um, one of the great outcomes of the pandemic that people began sharing their metadata and Google has been publishing smartphone GPS-based mobility indices, which we're looking at here. These are for Hawaii residents. Um, by the way, Google withdrew these data in the middle of October, 2022. So we have an interesting glimpse. Obviously, right after the onset of the pandemic, a big shift towards work from home, which a large portion of it was temporary under the circumstances necessary. But what's what I want to draw your attention to is that three years later, you can see a persistent about 25 to 30% reduction in the amount of time, amount of dwell time your smartphone spends in a conventional workplace. That's kind of interesting. Obviously, it has implications for for office space and other places people work in retail environments and food service establishments. And then the counterpart is more time at home, which if you think about it for a second, there are a lot of people that lived in homes where they didn't spend much time pre-COVID. And maybe now all of a sudden they're spending most of their time at home. And maybe that means they want a different kind of home. From I mean, I lived in an apartment for years while I was working in banking where I spent all my time at the office, you know what I mean? Get home after dark, late in the evening, eat out on the way home. So all I did was sleep in this apartment for a while. So that both implications of more time spent uh, at home and as a counterpart, much less time spent in conventional workplaces. And if you think about the pattern of behavior that follows from that, a lot of people stop in retail, food service, and recreational establishments like gyms on the way home from work. So if you're spending, turns out people spend 30% less time in the workplace 
Consequently, they spend 20% less time in retail, food service, and recreational establishments. And that's got a permanent kind of look to it, right? The, the, point, the five or six percentage points increase in time spent at home is coming out of this, um, uh, out of spending less time both in the workplace and in the places that uh, you see utilization that's attendant to workplace utilization. Um, now, if you look at spending, the spending's up, right? If you look at retail spending at groceries and food stores, it, it, it went up at the start of COVID right up and stayed up. You see what I mean? If you take out the groceries, it's even higher and it stayed higher. And yet, if you look at groceries and then retail establishments more broadly, uh, the dwell time is lower. So people are spending more money on retail. They're just not spending as much time in retail and food service, including food services establishments. Now, the implication that e-commerce has gone up, that's kind of a no duh. In fact, we actually can see this in the national data. After COVID, there's an L-shaped jump in the amount of retail sales activity that was actually, I mean, in actual constant, I mean, current dollars, billions of dollars, uh, e-commerce went up. The e-commerce share of total retail instantaneously went up, but it's it's hovered now at about 15% of the total, raising the question whether we've already reached a saturation point or you know whether it will continue on the trend of the last decade or peter out, right? Is saturation at 20% or 25%? Are we already there 15%? We don't know. But the point here is that what, there was a one-time shift and a corresponding downshift in the amount of time people spend in these places. So at, uh, on, the, on the intensive margin, right? Not, we're not building more malls and we're not building more restaurants, but in terms of the utilization of the existing office space, the existing commercial space, retail and food service establishments, there's less need for what we already had. And it's, you know, it's time to make adjustments and people are, right? People were converting office space to residential use in downtown Honolulu pre-COVID, but the announcement today was, you know, Avalon, is that pristine? Was, is gonna convert part of the old COH Davies building into residential. So I think there's opportunity there and we're not talking about building anew, but we're talking about repurposing, adapting existing space for the new reality of more work from home, more work remotely, and um, less use of the existing space. The counterpart in the housing market was fascinating because on Oahu, after COVID, such as there was a, a bubble, there wasn't much of a bubble, it happened only on the single family side of the market. It happened only in the de detached dwelling market segment, not in the multifamily or condo segment where prices after fading a little bit pre-COVID because of interest rate normalization at that time, valuations essentially reverted back to the path in the condo space that they were on uh, pre-COVID. Now, there's a, there's a special factor at work here. The city started to crack down on undocumented vacation rentals, many of whom, many of which were in the condo space, including ones in resort areas where they're putatively permitted to occur, but of course, if they just had never gotten on the city's approved list, uh, there was a bit of a fire sale that happened in the condo uh, segment. The point here is you can see that bubblicious arc of valuations on the single family side, and now a reversion to the underlying trend as a phenomenon uniquely associated with detached dwellings, which obviously have characteristics that are distinct from multifamily dwellings, right? You don't have to get in the elevator with somebody that might have COVID. And so that, pr that preference shift, some of which has to be rooted in remote work. In fact, we have data, I didn't include the slide, but people have calculated that about a half of the home price increase in the last two years in 2020 and 2021 or mid 2020 through mid 2022, about half of the increase in home prices nationwide is attributable to a remote work. As to say, you, you had 5% of people working from home full-time, maybe 10 hybrid, and now it's 20 to 25% in Hawaii and maybe 40% in San Francisco Bay Area. Well, only 3% of existing homes trade on Oahu in any given year, right? It's a really relatively small proportion of the existing uh, housing stock. So a, a change of five or 10 percentage points of the total of workers who can work remotely, work remotely implies 
something that could very well be material in percentage points, you know, alone, uh, when the the whole market is only three percent of uh, of the total housing market that's that's trading. If you think about the velocity, and um, okay, well that happened, and now it's petered out. And in fact, it's interesting to look at the pattern of what uh, Nick Bloom and his co-authors at Stanford and elsewhere, Chicago, and uh, the fellow from Mexico who have been watching this unfold in the, a pattern that they call the donut effect, where where a residential demand moves outward from the urban core to suburbs and exurbs and zoom towns like Maui. And in 2020, you saw this in the pattern of home price appreciation for single family homes, moving uh, demand moving and therefore higher rates of price increase in East Honolulu on the windward side, North shore in the highlands of Makakilo and Mililani. Whereas in the urban core prices were falling absolutely in 2020. Now, two years later, what happened? Well, the wave went out to the suburbs and exurbs, which meant relative prices were now low in the urban core. And so the backwash came in. And last year, in the face of rising interest rates, urban core prices were the ones that outperformed uh, as, a, as, a, as a rough generalization. Let me go back two slides. If you, if you think about, right, there's a, there's a relationship between median single family and median condo prices is relatively stable if they both appreciate at almost the same rate, then the, you know, the ratio is roughly two to one. Well, what happened in 2020, 2021 is that that, that multiple pulled away as single family home prices punched through from 1 million to 1.1 million, you know, looked like they were knocking on the door of 1.2 million for a while. And by the way, in December of 2022, they were the same price, as in December of 2021, they just went up and came back to the same level. But they pulled away, as you see, widened that differential. So condos were relatively a bargain in the la- in the in the you know year leading up to the Fed's increase and in interest rates. And when rates come back down, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. A, a, a final kind of indication of that's maybe almost the the last indication of weird things that's going on, weird L-shaped changes. Uh, These are uh, proxies for business formation. These are seasonally adjusted applications for federal employer ID numbers nationwide. Uh, But this is one of these time series, you would have thought it would jump temporarily as people start up their, you know, uh, podcast or their TikTok, whatever business, and then then go back to the underlying trend, which was upward. Uh, But no, it went up and it stayed there. It's just permanently higher, right? And hysteresis, right? A change you think is temporary, which turns out to be permanent. So when you look at what's happened in the workforce generally, um, uh, uh, Barrero and, uh, and um, what's his name? Uh, and Nick Bloom and uh, their co-author at Chicago um, uh, talk about this. Uh, they have an f- expression they call You've heard of long COVID, right? So they, they talk about long social distancing. That is, we socially distance by working remotely. And then a, a large proportion, maybe 30, you know, 10, 20, 30% of the workforce continues to operate in a socially distant, distanced workplace, spatially dispersed uh, workplace, uh, whereas uh, 30 to 40% either completely or substantially returned uh, to work pre-COVID, not 100%. And um, it's a simultaneous unplanned experiment that, you know, nobody could have thought it up, but it happened worldwide. And when you look at international data, um, workers want to uh, work from home uh, 1.7 days. Firms want them in the office 0.7 days and the average in a 27 country sample is about 1.5 days in the in the uh, in this uh, Stanford literature, which is very similar to what we got in our local Hawaii survey, people are willing to take a reduction in pay of about five percent in order to exercise the option or have the option of two to three uh, work days uh, at home. So we're not going back to the pre-COVID normal. Um, the increase in office vacancy from ten to fifteen percent, which will continue to drift upwards to you know, maybe 17 to 20% as leases expire and people 
make decisions on how much space uh, to take down when they renew. Uh, at the at, on the fringes of retail, same thing's kind of happening, and um, so a lot of opportunity for um, building owners and um, that want to reposition or adapt uh, to different kinds of uses and the different nature of the workplace. Uh, a lot of opportunity for workers who can take advantage of their the nature of their skill set if it allows them to. Uh, enhance their productivity, diminish the amount of commute time that they have to spend in order to remain productive. And um, which for which there's also a literature. And um, I think of, you know, a period of adjustment uh, because there are also benefits of proximity, right? There's, you know, there's technology transfer that happens in an office between older experienced workers and younger workers. And we'll have to figure out new ways to do that maybe in the metaverse over the next couple of years. I just, I just end on a, a bit of a cautionary note. Uh, Hawaii GDP in real terms was on the same path as the US for most of the last decade and then detached mysteriously after 2017. And I mean, I can think of a lot of reasons what was going on, the, you know, the, the floods on Kauai and vol volcanic eruptions on the big island probably should be on the list, but they're also sort of signaling events like the, the, the state government is signaling that it was done with astronomy. We're not going to build the 30 meter telescope. In fact, we're going to dismantle the telescope. So those kind of things. And then the thing with tourism now, you know, where we're going to deindustrialize de or, or uh, what, what's the expression that the tourism authority uses, right? We're going to um, decrease the total number of visitors to Oahu. That'll do it. And uh, so GDP has been declining for five or six years in Hawaii. The U.S. after COVID got right back on the path that it was on before, uh, whereas in the Great Recession there was a you know there was a step down in that trajectory, right? It's called a different stationary step. Whereas uh, the U.S. got right back up and back on the horse and is continuing on the same escalator it was on. Hawaii took a right turn and has yet to get back in the gap between where Hawaii was in the third quarter of last year, also known as three or four months ago, and where Hawaii would have been if it had stayed on its own trajectory of the last decade is 15 percentage points of GDP. That's roughly the size of tourism these days. And in a good year, tourism is only 17 or 18 percent of GDP. So the distant distance between where Hawaii's at and where it could have been just by downloading the latest app update and, you know, enjoying the associated productivity growth is the size of another tourism. You would need another tourism or the equivalent to get back to where Hawaii arguably uh, should be. And this is the blank slide of invisible content that I don't know uh, why it's there. Uh, again, if you would like to get a copy, uh, let me know somehow. My email address is Paul Brubaker with no dots. That's B-R-E-W-B-A-K-E-R, -E -E Paul Brubaker at TZ Economics, all one word tzeconomics.com, tangozuluconomics.com. So it's been great sharing this additional info. If you have questions, track me down. Uh, nice to see everybody at the conference today. Nicer even to see you on Zoom from time to time. So I'm down with that. Uh, mahalo, and I will stop share and say aloha. See you next time.